Thank you very much uh, for that introduction and also for the invitation to speak with you today. I'm particularly honored to, to give a lecture that's named for Helga Eng, who was both the first female professor and also a noted teacher. I too began my career as a high school English teacher before going on to get my doctorate and my roots are still very much in teaching today. So today I'm going to be talking about the confluence of several parts of my work that have to do both with the development of the idea of core practices for teaching and the development of observation protocols, not only to study and measure teaching, but also for the improvement of teaching and how these two ideas come together. And there are some that have argued that observation protocols are a way of deprofessionalizing or de-skilling teachers, that they're too reductive. Um, but I would actually argue the opposite, and I'll try to convince you that in fact, such protocols and developing such a, a common language is part of the effort to professionalize teaching and to empower educators to take responsibility for the improvement of the work. So let me talk a little bit about uh, what we mean by entering professional practice as a way of studying that work. So when we talk about entering professional practice, we talk really about entering a community of professionals. It's becoming part of a tradition of professional practice that entails having a common language with which to speak about the work, common intensive professional preparation that people generally share, developing the foundational knowledge that you need for professional practice, developing a common technical language to talk about the work, as well as common ways of thinking and doing. So we think about learning to think like a lawyer, for example. And part of law school helps people develop that mode of legal reasoning. They're also learning legal terminology, like torts, like I don't know what the Norwegian term is there, but they're learning a very specific technology, technological language, to describe the work of the profession. So entering professional practice is not an individual affair. It really is entering this community of practice. And the purpose of some of this is to enable the profession to keep developing and growing. So when individuals enter professional practice, they're able to build upon the prior knowledge, expertise, research, and enter into that and again, continue to improve it because another responsibility of professionals is to contribute to that knowledge base within the profession. So when we think again about entering a practice, we're again focused on what do other professions, not just teaching, have in common in this area. Now, teaching of course has been debated as whether or not it is a profession or not. And one of the reasons it has been debated is the absence of this common technical language, as well as a specialized knowledge base. <laughs> Most of the work that went on in the 1980s, some of it under my dissertation advisor, Lee Shulman, was intended to develop the idea of a specialized knowledge base for teachers called pedagogical content knowledge, which would address this issue. But we're still searching in many ways for that common technical language with which to describe teaching. So this is not new. This is something that uh, Lordy talked about long ago, back in the 70s, and other people have remarked upon, that teaching doesn't necessarily have a shared technical language to describe the work, particularly the nuances of the work that we would all have in common. And that language is particularly important when you think of newcomers to the field and how they, again, enter into the field and take advantage of the wisdom of practice, which can be codified when you have categories and language to describe that practice. So Lordy, long ago, identified this, this problem, this essential problem of teaching, that without having that framework, 
It's harder for novices to tap into that knowledge and harder for the field to accumulate knowledge, to uh, continue to codify the wisdom of practice so that newcomers can learn from it. So I, I always laugh when I think about the kind of language that we have. In the 70s, there was some work on classroom management and they coined the term with itness. That, that was technical language to describe a skill in classroom management. Well, that's a pretty vague term. <laughs> with, I don't know what, what's the Norwegian equivalent to with itness. <laughs> being there, being attentive, but it's a very casual phrase. It wouldn't qualify in English as technical language <laughs> in any way. So again, part of my interest in developing this notion of core practices comes out of what does it mean to build a profession? How can we work together, and this is researchers and practitioners, to build such a common language and understanding that we travel across institutions, across universities and schools, across multiple schools, and in the case of some of the work we've been doing on Plato, maybe even across national boundaries. That allows us again to more intentionally build that knowledge base to accumulate uh, knowledge about teaching. So this has really been the driving force for much of my work for a very long time. I'm most focused on teacher education in part because it's in beginning professional preparation that you begin to build this base. So if we don't have it, it really affects how we prepare teachers. And teachers graduate thinking that teaching is more of an idiosyncratic activity, that every teacher who enters the field is, in essence, reinventing the wheel, starting from scratch, creating their own materials, not realizing that there's a whole history and tradition they can then tap into. So um, I was doing a study, I'll refer to a number of different studies. This was one of my favorite studies, uh, where I was trying to compare teaching to other professions. But I didn't want to use the usual professions teaching was being compared to in the United States, which were teaching, in, I mean, law and medicine. Because teaching is actually not very like those professions in the United States, either by the people who go into it or the nature of the work. So I was looking for professions that depended on relational practice because part of what defines teaching is you have to build relationships with your students and everything depends on that relationship, right? And if you can do that, then you can be very successful. If you can't do it, you're gonna struggle. So I looked at clinical psychology in the clergy as analogous professions and went and visited the professional preparation programs in those areas. And one of the really interesting things I found in clinical psychology is they had agreed as a field that there were these common factors in clinical psychology that every beginner had to know. And one of them was developing a therapeutic relationship with your client because they actually had done the research to find that if you built a therapeutic relationship with your client, many treatments would work. If you didn't, nothing worked. And just said, you might as well stop right there because it's not gonna be effective. So they had developed that knowledge base on some of these fundamental practices. And then, Every time we went to a program of clinical psychology, they were actually teaching those practices. They had unpacked, what does it mean to develop a therapeutic relationship? How do you even use things like body language, proximity, as well as talk to develop that connection with your client? And they taught that very intentionally to the students, realizing that it was, again, one of those foundational practices. So that began to make me think about what are the analogous practices in teaching? What are those things that we think are so fundamental to the practice that we should make sure that every knowledge has the opportunity to learn? And that, again, are in some ways the building blocks 
of more complex practice. So a group of us in the United States from different perspectives have begun to work on this problem of trying to identify and specify these core practices of teaching. Now, these <coughs> practices, which you can immediately see my interest as a teacher educator, we could then target in teacher education. So the Core Practice Consortium, which I direct, is a group of scholars from 13 universities across the United States who have been doing research on core practices, beginning to target some of these in our teacher ed programs, agree on what we mean by them, developing common language and specification, and then trying them out in our courses and following our students into the field. Teaching Works at the University of Michigan is doing something similar. They call it high leverage practices, but it's very much that same idea. Of these are really foundational practices. So as I talk about this, one of the things that I've realized is when I talk about core practices, people sometimes have in their mind a list of competencies. So I want to make clear from the beginning that when we talk about these practices, we're not thinking of disembodied skills that are divorced from theory or the purposes of education as broader education. The way we define practice is really a sociocultural perspective that says that practice in complex domains includes understanding and skill, includes identity, professional identity that you see yourself, as well as the broader goals of the profession. And that you're doing this together. The practice, again, is a communal rather than individual construct. So when we think of these core practices, there are technical aspects to them, but they're very closely tied to the underlying theories of teaching and learning, as well as to this, again, this notion of professional socialization. So core practices, as we've defined them, are practices that are central to the daily work of teaching. They're not extraordinary. They're actually very typical. And when I do this work with teachers, they all say, oh, yes, of course. These are things we do every day. That's exactly what you want to hear. If they work, things teachers recognize, and it wouldn't be core practices, right? So things that are fundamental to the daily work of teaching, they're central to supporting student learning. Right? These are things that we do not just because they're what teachers do, they do it to support learning because that's the ultimate goal of teaching. We see them as fundamental to developing more sophisticated, more complex forms of practice. So again, all of these practices are things that teachers continue to work on across their careers. I'm still learning to facilitate productive classroom discussions as a university teacher. I've been doing this since I was a novice secondary teacher. Um, it takes different forms and shapes, but some of those building blocks are the same. And this, this last point is an interesting one because we're beginning to play with this. We, we really thought about these core practices as ones that travel, that they support ambitious learning, but you might find them in different kinds of curriculum. They're not tied to a specific curriculum. So some examples of core practices. And again, these should be easily recognizable. Eliciting student thinking. If you can't elicit student thinking, you're never going to learn what students think. You're never going to build your repertoire of student conceptions and misconceptions. It's absolutely fundamental to teaching. Another one is providing instructional explanations. You might be doing that very quickly as you're talking with an individual student during group work. You might be doing that as part of a lecture. But part of what teachers need to learn how to do is to provide clear, accurate, concise instructional explanations. Facilitating productive classroom discourse. Teaching clear routines for managing transitions. I thought you did a very good job getting everybody to quiet down immediately. Again, uh, in order to make sure that you have time for learning, you've got to make sure that you are uh, good at managing these kinds of transitions. And communicating with parents. Uh, teaching goes beyond the classroom. One of the things, again, teachers need to learn to do is to communicate well with parents about their students. Now, these are all generic 
notice. These would, I would argue, be things that teachers in any subject might need to develop. And there's been a debate about whether or not core practices are generic or subject specific. I argue they're both. There are some practices I think that we could agree are useful across subject areas, but then there are other practices that adhere in the particular subject or discipline that you might not use if you were teaching another discipline. So for example, in math, launching a math problem to provoke mathematical thinking. Now, as an English teacher, I never did that, and I probably never would do that. <laughs> But a math teacher needs to know how to do this, needs to know what that launch looks like. They also need to know how to select productive math problems for the purpose they're teaching. I have to worry about selecting the right text for my goals for instruction. It, it's different. Um, in history, selecting and adapting primary source documents, helping develop students' ability to reason historically and to use primary source documents in that. Again, that's very specific to history, not something many of us would do. English metal, modeling metacognitive strategies for reading and writing, absolutely central to work in language arts. Not something probably that most teachers of other subjects are doing, although sometimes they might in, te in teaching writing across the curriculum. Science, identifying a testable question for inquiry. So I would argue that there are both a set of more general core practices and then a set of subject-specific practices that are specific to that discipline. So I'm now going to check for understanding, which is a very important core practice <laughs> in assessing student learning. And what I want you to do is to watch this classroom discussion of a short story. It's taken from the Lisa study, so it's an eighth grade Norwegian <coughs> class at the beginning of the year. And the students have all read the, a short story called The Night. Um, and I want you to think about what core practices you can identify in this class. What are some of the core practices that you can see in this class? Okay? And thank you. I think it was Marta, maybe, who did the uh, translation for me for the subtitles. <laughs> Oh, this is 
that you saw in this clip. And I will try to get out of here.
between something they've done at home to something they're discussing in class. Uh, building relations with the students by continuously using their names. Nice, okay. Building that relationship. Nice. Yes. Uh, eliciting student uh, thinking. Yes. yes. Doing a lot of that. A lot of eliciting student thinking. Yes. Asking I and what questions? Asking questions, right? And then looking at what questions are being asked. Uh, any, we're having a gender imbalance in participation. <laughs> <laughs> here from any, ah, yes, here we have a couple. So I, I noticed making a connection between something the student says and a concept of a factor better. So this notion of repetition came out of the student concept, which is we're going to talk about this. Excellent. She's highlighting something that they're going to come back to, right? Posting that so that they can write that. Yes. Okay, so it goes back to uh, asking questions, eliciting student thinking, not necessarily uh, connecting student ideas or having students respond to one another. So this was a great check because I can see you get the concept. <laughs> so again, I think it's very useful to always when we did when I now move into observation protocols, everything we did was linked to videos of classroom practice to again make sure that we ground it in what's happening in classrooms. So the key idea is just to end this part of the talk. The key ideas about core practices is again they represent a kind of grammar of practice that provides a common professional language for both describing teaching and now I'm going to argue for improving professional practices at all. Teaching, like many other forms of complex human performance, can be taught and learned. So again, one of the core key ideas around core practices is we can teach them. We can teach people to get better at them. As in other kinds of areas of human performance, some people will have natural talent in some aspects of this, but the argument is that people, anyone, will get better in this with, again, practice and support. And finally, these practices are ones that teachers continue to refine over their course of their career, that while we might target them in professional preparation, they're things that you're continuing to develop over your career. So now I'm going to link the work that we've been doing on observation protocols to this notion of core practice. So observation protocols are tools that have been mostly used for research purposes, and they're developed to be able to provide reliable measurement of classroom instruction over multiple classrooms. So the alternative is, is the deep ethnographic work of having people going in and writing extensive field notes where they might pay attention to different things, they might capture different things, and it's very hard to do that across thousands of classrooms. Uh, observation protocols are a way, again, of having a set of lenses with which you look at instruction. So I always argue that no classroom protocol, classroom observation protocol, is going to capture all of teaching. Teaching is much too complex for any single protocol to capture. 
Some are going to focus on the relational aspects of uh, instruction. Some might focus only on needs of special needs learners or focus only on particular elements of instruction. They're all a set of lenses, but the argument is if we all put on this set of lenses, we'll see the same things and we'll be able to describe them in similar ways. So it's really been, again, a tool that's been used primarily in research to measure the quality of instruction. Increasingly in the US, it's been used for teacher evaluation as well. So some of you might be familiar with observation protocols. Some generic protocols include the class, which was developed for use in early childhood and is now used in every Head Start classroom in America, which is, again, early childhood. The framework for teaching, which is the most commonly used framework in the United States, developed by uh, Charlotte Danielson and used widely now in teacher evaluation. And then there are ones that have been used primarily for res research, like the IPM video scoring manuals developed by Tina Seidel and her colleagues and the PISA Plus manuals. So these are examples of more general protocols. And subject-specific protocols, there are fewer of them. Two examples are Plato, which is the tool that we developed for language arts teaching, and the mathematical quality of instruction developed by Heather Hill and her colleagues at Harvard that focuses only on mathematics. There are some for science. Um, within language arts, there's some that focus only on reading comprehension. So there's, there's a whole array of these um, that exist. So as we were developing our tool, Plato, and trying to get hundreds of raters to be reliable, I began to realize this was an incredible resource for more than just research. One, it begins to develop a coherent image of high quality instruction and the technical language to go with it, right? It examples in order to train people in these observation protocols, You've got to get videos that show that element of teaching at different levels of quality. So you've collected all of this video. And in essence, these observation protocols begin to articulate and specify sets of core practices. Right? You can begin to see, as you see these observation protocols, how they represent core practices. They're also designed and, and work to develop professional vision, some common ways of both describing and seeing classrooms. One of the things we learned anecdotally from our raters, many of whom were teachers, is that they, they thought this was incredibly useful because they began to have a language to describe what they were doing in classrooms. And they began to feel that their own teaching was getting better just by rating other classrooms around this scale. So it began to serve its purpose again in this professional socialization. It also enables leaders, schools, districts to gather diagnostic data on the quality of instruction across schools. So we could make some claims about, well, what is the state of math teaching? What is the state of language arts teaching? Where are teachers strong? Where are they less strong? And how then do we target those areas for professional development? <coughs> One of the arguments of improvement science is that you cannot improve at scale what you cannot reliably measure at scale. That if you want to work on improving anything, you've got to have ways of measuring that thing you're trying to improve to show whether or not actually your interventions are working. So again, one of the purposes of these classroom observation protocols could be in service of instructional improvement. Not just a way of measuring and taking snapshots, but then actually use it as part of intentional improvement efforts. So let me uh, unpack a few of these observation protocols, and then I'll go more deeply into the protocol that I have been developing and using, uh, and that is now being used here in Norway, the Plato. So the framework for teaching, um, this is the Danielson framework. It's divided into four domains, only two of which you actually see classroom interaction, domains two and three. 
Domain one is planning the things you do before teaching, and domain four has to do with professional responsibility. And as you look at the instructional domain, you should recognize some core practices, communicating with students, using questioning techniques, using assessments and instruction, uh, developing flexibility and responsiveness. Mathematical quality of teaching, which I mentioned earlier, here you can see it's focused very much on math. And here the domains target mathematics and the, the rigor and quality of the mathematics work that's happening related to the richness, so the extent to which they're actually working on math and how teachers deal with error and imprecision in math. Again, the purposes have been in the US have been largely used for teacher evaluation and research. But when the framework was first developed, actually as part of a teacher testing effort, um, Charlotte Danielson early on recognized that maybe the best value of these frameworks is for professional conversation improvement. That they provide, again, that common language for professional community to organize around. So that's where I'm going to turn now, is how do we use these observation protocols that are widely being used for other purposes directly to support instructional improvement? And here I'll focus on Plato, which is the development, the tool that I develop. Plato has four domains, each of which is composed of multiple elements. So again, I'm hoping that these domains sound familiar. They shouldn't sound strange. One of them is instructional scaffolding. Uh, what are the kinds of supports that teachers provide to help students learn the content? And that includes modeling. These are all for language arts modeling, strategy instruction, the quality of feedback, and accommodations for language learners. In the United States, we have many, many students who, uh, for whom English is their second language. And in English classes in particular, this is a big challenge. How do we support them in learning English along with learning the content? The disciplinary demand has to do with the cognitive and intellectual press of the classrooms. So the intellectual challenge, the quality and nature of classroom discourse, and for language arts classrooms, text-based instruction the extent to which students are actually engaged either in reading or writing texts, which is core to language arts. Representations and use of content, how teachers, this was where instructional explanations would fall, the clarity of their instructional explanation, the accuracy of the content, their ability to create examples that connect to student experience, and draw on students' prior experience, as well as their ability to make connections to students' prior knowledge in connecting it to new knowledge. And then classroom environment. Now this is, in many ways, I, I would argue, the least well-developed part of Plato, um, because it's not, was not our central interest. Um, L, protocols like class are much more elaborate around the classroom environment, because that was their focus. But we realized that we needed to make sure that we understood how teachers were managing time and managing behavior, because in many ways, that's a mediating factor for everything else. If you don't have that in place, and we've actually found this to be true, it's pretty hard to do some of these other things. Okay, so those are the Play-Doh elements. Each of these has a description. It comes along with the rubric, which I'll show you, and, and extensive training, as some of you know, because some of you have gone through the training, to understand what we mean by these and what we consider high quality materials. Once we had used Plato as part of this met, big MET study and we used it to identify practices of highly effective teachers, I got very interested in the, what I see as their primary use in supporting teacher learning and continued professional development. So we got a grant to work with a group of language arts teachers in a district. We were working with half the middle schools, which is like your lower secondary um, in this district. And what we did is we organized it around Plato. So we first used the data diagnostically. So we observed the teachers using Plato taught the teachers the Play-Doh instruments so they understood what those elements were. 
and then began to do the professional development. So let me start with this first part, observing the teachers with Plato. So here are those elements along the bottom and the average scores of the teachers. The amazing thing is that yesterday I was seeing examples of Plato scores in both Norway and Sweden and they looked a lot like this. <laughs> so this, this is not an unusual graph. So what you notice is that teachers are very good at managing time and behavior. That generally is not the problem. We saw that in the clip as well. Um, teachers on Plato score very high and actually in the next study they scored high. That was the highest scores across the observation protocols was in this area. Not all teachers score high, so there's a lot of variability here, but in general, this seems to be a strength. Then we look at what they score less well in, and these are classroom discourse and strategy instruction with the two lowest scores for the teachers in this district. Followed also by modeling was another one. So the things that fall into our instructional scaffolding which is very worrisome because if you think of instructional scaffolding as what students need to learn and it's not happening, then you're concerned. So after we did this, um, all of this observation, we then showed that same graph that I just showed you to the teachers. And we let the teachers identify two of the practices that they wanted to target for the professional development work. Again, I think that's important because if we want teachers to own this work and to buy into this, we want them to be invested in the aspects of practice that they're working on. Um, so we all held our breath while the teachers voted on what they would work on. And in fact, they chose the two elements of Plato, strategy use of instruction and classroom discourse, that as a group they scored lowest on. So we were all in agreement that this is what we were going to work on. And then we began to work very intensively on just those two elements of instruction. Because it's, these, are, these are all hard. They're all hard to make progress on. And trying to do everything, we would argue, means that you have less success on moving, making changes in one, any one area. So here's an example of the Plato rubric in classroom discourse. Classroom discourse is composed of two sub-components, the quality of uptake of student responses. So once you've elicited student thinking, what do you do with it, right? There's research that suggests that the quality of uptake is related to student achievement. This is research, again, in language arts classrooms. And there's a lot of, the, while a lot of this work has happened in language arts, there's also work in mathematics on the quality of uptake. And then the opportunities for students, are students talking at all? The really sad thing is that in most American classrooms, students aren't talking. The average score across 6,000 teachers on Plato uh, was a little right around two, which means that the teacher's doing most of the talking and students are providing short answers, what we call the recitation format, or IRB. That's still the modal classroom discourse in, this, in our country. So again, unpacking uptake a little bit, uh, I want you to think about the clip that we watched earlier in which there are multiple examples of uptake. So uptake can vary from no uptake at all, where either the kids are not responding, People are saying things and there's no response, or there's a okay. To brief responses, to brief responses and then what we call higher level uptake, which is either revoicing in an academic language. Um, it might be asking students to respond to one another. It might be posting or highlighting a comment and asking other people to respond to that. And at the four level, it's consistently high, high level uptake. So as you think about the teacher that we watched earlier, just think for a minute of where you think she might fall on this category. I'm just gonna have you think about it for uptake. Where is she strong? 
And where might she benefit from improvement? You go back to the previous slide. Yeah. So I'll give you, um, I'm only going to give you a minute this time to talk to the person next to you about where you think she's strong and where she might benefit from improvement. <laughs> instance where she uh, identifies that a, a student's comment is important, repetition, and that it's tied to a larger goal, which would, they will address in later lessons. Exactly. So she's highlighting using that, then linking it to the academic language of literary devices, and then also tells them we're going to be coming back to this. Okay? So a nice use of uptake. Okay. Um, an idea of where she might improve. She could perhaps get more students to talk to each other and increase the level of participation by doing that. Okay, so in the Plano rubric, we actually privilege, privilege a little bit of student to student talk, and there's very little example there of student to student talk or asking students to do that cognitive work of doing that expansion. So that is when they're learning that everything doesn't have to come through her, but how to get students to build on each other's ideas. Great. So you've just got an example of how we would use this rubric in professional development to sort of identify what teachers are already doing well, and then how to build on that, and where the next step is. Using the rubric is, in a sense, a kind of guide, uh, guide for doing that kind of work. So in the professional development that we design, we rely on the framework for teaching practice that my colleagues and I developed in that study of clinical psychologists, teachers, and clergy, where we argue that to learn professional practice, teachers need opportunities first to see high quality representations of high quality practice, that it's very hard to do something you've never seen. And you know, there are a lot of things in teaching that are fairly rare, that we would all consider a high quality, but we don't see every day. This is where video becomes such an incredible tool and value, is being able to see that examples of skilled performance. So I have an example here from cooking. You can go on YouTube and you can see multiple videos, for example, of how to chop an onion. And part of what they do is they unpack the practice. Rather than just saying, yeah, you just want to go and chop an onion, they actually say, you should hold the onion like this. You should use this kind of a knife. If you want this kind of thing, you're going to position it this way. And they do what we call the decomposition of practice. They unpack practice so that people can actually see what it means to lead productive classroom discussion. How often do we say, go in and we want you to lead a really great discussion without actually breaking down all the different parts of what goes into that. 
So the decomposition, unpacking of practice is a very important part. It's also kind of what these observation protocols do, right? They're breaking the part. Practice and trying to give you that, that finer grain. The third part is deliberate practice. Providing teachers opportunities, safe spaces in which they can try out some new practices. There's nothing harder for a teacher to do than to fail publicly in a classroom full of I taught adolescents. You know, it's not fun. And so people avoid trying new things often because it's hard to do it for the first time uh, in that setting. So how can you create what we call approximations of practice, rehearsals, role plays, we saw those widely used in clinical psychology, where you're first trying out some of these practices with the support of your peers and getting feedback before you try it in the context of real practice. And then the third is getting very targeted, actionable feedback on the practice that helps you, again, figure out where you can improve. So my bottom example, those of you who've seen the movie Julia and Julie about Julia Child, remember when she doesn't know how to chop an onion, she goes home and she chops a mountain of onions. It's focused on one element. She's not cooking things, she's not using, she's just chopping an onion. How often do we give teachers that opportunity to try to target one aspect of helping unpack a student's idea? and really um, practice that. So if we believe in the notion of deliberate practice, this is really important. So this is the kind of work we did with the teachers in our study. We met monthly as a whole group, and then met with them in their schools uh, every other month or so, doing these kinds of both representations of practice, helping them, giving them lots of examples of what high quality strategy instruction looked like, and then opportunities to try it out. So they would plan the lessons together, we would do rehearsals in front of one another. Um, and we did this for two years. Um, so at the end of two years, we did begin to see, we had a control group and a, uh, the, the treatment group, the participants, and we did see change. So you can see that the people who did not participate in professional development stayed exactly the same on Plato in terms of classroom discussion and the participating teachers group. And we saw a similar gain in strategy instruction. Um, flat with it, which you would expect, right? They weren't getting any targeted professional development. This, these charts mask a lot of variability. So I'm gonna show you two very complicated graphs that I'll try to talk you through that break it down by duration of professional development. So cohort one actually had two years of this intervention. They were with us for two full years. Each line represents an individual teacher. And what you can see is there was upward trajectory for almost everybody, some of it's steeper than others, but the, the general trajectory is upward. If you look at cohort two who only had one year of the professional development, you see a much more mixed picture. Some people improved, some people stayed the same, some people seem to decline. So one of the things, again, that we're trying to figure out is, is how, again, do you help improve practice, what elements of professional development support that. And one of the things we've learned is that duration matters. It's hard to change practice, and it was the teachers who were engaged for two years that really showed those improvements. Second, we found that foundational practice mattered. Teachers who were good planners and good at classroom management and managing time and behavior showed much more improvement and much more uptake of these practices. Teachers who struggled either with classroom environment or planning really didn't make the same kind of progress, which was really interesting to us. And, and again, thought about the ways in which we need to differentiate professional development to say, let's start again where the teachers are and figure out how to help them with the elements that are challenging before maybe moving on to some of the more difficult elements of this. And finally, um, and this made me happy, is the teachers really liked this um, 
this particular professional development because they felt that these were practices that they understood. They weren't new. We weren't trying to get them to do something radically different. They knew they were important, and often they knew they weren't doing much of it, right? So they were eager for the opportunity to work in these areas and also happy to have the common language. And the department, so we chose teachers, groups of teachers from the same school, began to use this as a way of talking together about their practice and beginning to sort of coordinate in their departmental discussions as well. So there have been other studies of the use of observation protocols for professional development. My teaching partner grew out of class, which I mentioned earlier. And once again, they found that coaching and access to the video library, those two things together, think about representations and high quality feedback, led to greater improvements in interactions with children. And again, duration, having a full year of PD needs the student. MQI coaching found something very similar. Again, teachers who, who went through MQI coaching and developed, again, an understanding of these practices scores significantly higher. So we're beginning to see, again, results across these different observation protocols. Maybe one of the most interesting examples, though, is a new study that's just come out um, that was done in Tennessee, where all of the teachers are observed on the framework for teaching as part of teaching evaluation. And in this randomized field experiment, they pair teachers in the same schools, one of whom scored high, let's say on classroom discourse, and one of whom scored low on classroom discourse, and told them to work together. That was the extent of the intervention, which is just a little bit surprising to me. Now, this was a state in which those evaluations are tied to, uh, those observations are tied to teacher evaluations, so they are important for teachers. But what they found was that the students in the treatment schools made greater gains after this intervention than students in the control. So there was a change in student achievement. And the effects were stronger for the target teachers, the teachers who were scoring low, who received that intervention. So this seems to be very promising, again, as we think about the use of these kinds of tools for helping teachers teach each other and begin to work together towards the improvement of instructional practice. So let me conclude, in essence, where I started. It's been a long journey, and as I said, when we developed Plato, I never thought that we would, I would become the developer of an observation protocol. But it's very consistent in many ways with my goals across my career, which are to improve and professionalize teaching as a practice and contribute to de developing that common language and vision for high quality instruction so that we have more agreement on, on what we mean when we say somebody's a good teacher. It also shows the promise of engaging teachers in these observation protocols. Um, in some of the studies, they, they hire raters who are not educators. Some of them are college students. And I think that's an incredible waste of an opportunity because the more the teachers have the opportunity to be trained in the observation protocols, the more they will be able to notice and think in these same ways. And again, I think the ultimate destination is how do we provide more rich learning opportunities for teachers to learn to improve their craft. So I will stop there. Thank you very much for your question.